speaker will be there to kick off the, the event. Okay, to start the day, I'd like to introduce uh, the opening address will be delivered by Dr. Stephen Martin. He is the chairman of GSTF and current chief executive of committee of economic development of Australia, chairman of Bank of China Australia. Dr. Stephen Martin. Thank you, Carla. I'll, I'll go without it. Welcome, welcome to Singapore. Welcome to the Great Wall of Singapore, just here. I'm not sure exactly uh, why this happened, but don't feel on this side that you're not related to this side, and this side, don't you feel that you're not related to these people as well. You'll all mix during the course of the breaks and uh, at lunchtime, I'm sure. Look, on behalf of Dr. Anton, who is the Chief Executive of uh, GSTF, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to Singapore to these two conferences. Whilst uh, the numbers itself may reflect uh, that uh, we're um, a little smaller than as usual, nevertheless the quality of the papers that have been submitted and uh, which will be, will be spoken to and the keynote speeches that will be delivered, I think will set the scene for quite uh, a good discussion in both ICT and in business strategy. Um, from my own perspective, I've been involved with the GSTF since it started some uh, seven years ago. Uh, we started with one event, uh, it was in the area of uh, ICT at the time, and uh, we've expanded since. And I think most of you would be aware that the academic conferences that we promote, these two being uh, part of that, uh, part of the family, are only a small part of what we do. But it's a significant part. And I say to people that come to our conferences, there should always be something that you take away with you. That something can be either knowledge that you've gained from somebody presenting in a subject field that you have an interest in. Perhaps even the opportunity when you're listening to somebody talk on a particular matter, you think to yourself, wait a minute, I might be in Germany or Ireland or wherever, these people may be in Chengdu or Beijing, but they're doing the same similar sort of research. Here is an opportunity possibly to collaborate. And so we might get academic collaboration. And as a consequence, the knowledge gets spread across the globe. And the third thing that I find is always really good is that you make new friends when you come to these conferences. The fact is that while you're able to discuss in, in earnest, academic issues, importantly as well, you get to know people and you get to know friends and you know, who knows, you might be passing through their hometown sometime in the future looking for a bed. So it's always good to get to know people when you come to conferences such as this. Um, the truth is that when we talk about ICT, when we talk about business strategy, there is a, a bit of synergy that is associated between the two streams that uh, these conferences are about today. Um, my day job back in Australia these days is as the Chief Executive Officer of the Committee for Economic Development of Australia, or CEDA. It is a, it's probably Australia's most uh, well-respected, renowned, independent economic and social policy think tank. And what we seek to do is to try and drive good public policy debate for governments and for business to adopt policies that are going to lead the economic and therefore the social growth of Australia. Now, business strategy becomes an incredibly important part of that in my own context, because a large number of companies that are members of CEDA, we are a not-for-profit membership organisation, a large number of those companies are in fact engaged in constantly reviewing, revising their business strategies, but importantly as well, with digital disruption, the fact that we're staring down the barrel of the greatest industrial revolution the world has ever known with computer technology, all of that comes together. And so um, if you have an interest, uh, go on to the CEDA website, have a look at some of the research work we've done. Two years ago, we talked about the future of work. What did that mean for the growth in Australia of jobs in the future? What did digital disruption the industrial revolution that is computerization, robotics and so on, what was that going to mean for Australia's economic future? And importantly, what business strategies were businesses, large and small, because 80% of businesses in Australia are small businesses, 
What are those business strategies going to be to enable them to meet the challenges of changes in technology coupled with the change nature of the Australian economy? Now, now we're doing pretty well. The truth is we are doing pretty well in Australia. We've, got, we've just had the Reserve Bank, which is our central bank, uh, lower interest rates again to 1.5%, which is probably the historically low point for Australia in its entire history, trying to stimulate a bit more business activity. We've got a growth rate, nevertheless, of about 2.75%. And if any of you are from Europe or any of you are from the United States, you could kill for something like that, I suspect, at the moment. Um, all of that means that the Australian economy, whilst it's going through a major change, coming off the back of being dependent almost entirely on mining investment, that change is meaning that business strategy and the application of ICT, the application of digital disruption technology, becomes even more critical for us. Because while the conversations are being developed in Australia by my organisation, similar organisations and the government of the day, those same conversations I have no doubt are being had in your countries as well. There will be meetings all the time, as I say, when I'm around promoting what we do in our research work. There will be similar sort of meetings taking place in Beijing, in London, in New York, in Harare, it doesn't matter. Those conversations will be taking place because exactly the same sorts of things that affect us in Australia affect all of you. You no longer have to live and do business where you live. Doesn't matter where you live. You can do business anywhere around the globe now because of ICT. And people have to recognise that that is not just a challenge, but it is an enormous opportunity. So I'm hopeful that today, uh, in the course of your deliberations, your discussions, that these sorts of very important and significant matters about the way in which business strategy becomes important for Australia and for your country and for the world generally and the way in which ICT and the various uh, applications of ICT can, can assist more generally, not just in business of course, but more generally. I mean again, some of the work that we did was the way in which uh, uh, the health system in Australia, for example, might benefit through improvements in ICT. But also, I might say, changes the way in which hospitals are run. So therefore, business approaches to dealing with the healthcare provision. All of these things are now globally significant. As I say, what we might be thinking about at home, you guys are going to be thinking about as well in your own countries. They're just as critical for you. You may be in economies where you've got ageing populations. You may be in economies that have got growing young people. It doesn't matter. The simple truth is that having strong economies on the back of a very strong business culture informed by the technology applications that are constantly flowing is going to be what drives each of our various countries forward. So look, uh, I think this is a great opportunity for you. and I. I the other benefit, of course, about having small groups is you can get into that dialogue a bit closer. You know, if somebody's talking about something, well, don't feel bashful about asking a question. You know, get into it. That's what academic dialogue is all about. And so I wish you every success as you do that today. I'll be around. Uh, Dr. Anton will be around as well a little later. Uh, and, of course, I'll be back this afternoon uh, where we make presentations for the best academic papers and so on and to wish you Godspeed when you're heading home. But look, uh, those that haven't been to Singapore before, welcome, great town, great town. Uh, plan to see and do, make sure you do that, see and do. Uh, plenty of things uh, in this place to keep you uh, entertained and interested. Uh, it's a very safe city, it's a wonderful place to be and, and, and conferences uh, of this nature give you a chance to sort of uh, globalise your own views of the way in which a major Asian city operates. So look, thank you for being with us. As I said, the, uh, our organisation has been around for some seven years. We are a membership organisation. If you'd like to become a member, please, GFTF would welcome you as a member of our organisation. Uh, we have conferences and a raft of different things on an annual basis, and our website lists all of those. Those for next year have already been uh, listed on our website. So, again, I just invite you to have a look at that. Uh, and, of course, we also publish a number of different journals where many of the topics that you guys are going to be talking about, uh, in fact, find their way. So, uh, thank you for being with us again. I look forward to seeing you uh, during the course of the day. Um, delighted, of course, that uh, the next, uh, at the business strategy, the keynote speaker that's going to follow me is my old friend uh, Ian Eddy. Well, he and I 
worked together for a period of time uh, on the Gold Coast and uh, it's always good to see him back here. I know he's uh, an absolutely committed, dedicated and, uh, and, and very good academic and I think in the business strategy stream you're going to get a lot from uh, Ian's presentation. But look, it's good to see you all. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm not going to stand between the Great Wall and the two sides of the two groups. Uh, I'll let you go to your various areas and uh, we'll catch up again sometime during the course of the day. Welcome to Singapore. Welcome to GSTF. I hope you get a lot from your conference and I hope you stay connected with us. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, so uh, for those who are attending ICT, do make yourself comfortable in this room. So those who are attending this strategy, do proceed to uh, Lavender too. Yeah, you go by this way. Thank you. Karen Lee, um, professor in Department of Computer Science and Technology from Hong Kong, from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, HKUST. So apart from that, he's um, director of Sino Software Research Institute, and he's also chair for Task Force on Entrepreneurship Education. Let's welcome his keynote. Today I would like to share with you actually um, okay. So I would like to actually share with you okay, the work that I'm doing uh, basically is augmenting a fog uh, under the cloud. So uh, this is actually to innovate large scale uh, 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 internet video streaming. So uh, I have been working on this project <coughs> in my group for, uh, you know, in the past four to five years, and I'm basically turning the research on fault computing, on cloud computing, to serve video community, basically internet broadcasting. So, uh, I will share some of my experience today uh, on this. So, I guess uh, I don't need to, uh, you know, say too much about internet video. Uh, actually, internet video broadcasting has come to age. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, uh, the past, uh, 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 World Cup, uh, India or, or NCAA men's basketball, uh, we see that there's a lot of concurrent users. Actually, in, uh, in Olympics just now, uh, uh, and uh, we see that a lot of concurrent users accessing broadcast channels around the world using internet. So, uh, internet, internet broadcast has already come to our desktop, come to the edge. And when we are, uh, uh, look at internet video, we would like to sort of enjoy video anywhere, anytime. Uh, with any devices. So the devices can be the TV, uh, big screen panel, or it can be your handhelds. So the handhelds can be the mobile phones, uh, it can be uh, your tabs, right? It can be any kind of devices <coughs> that you would like to view videos live, okay, uh, over the internet, accessing the internet, uh, uh, you know, around the globe. So that is actually the vision, uh, and uh, we would like, we actually will see in the future, like increasingly mobile users are going to access videos live over the internet uh, uh, through uh, video broadcasting. So um, the, uh, the, we have seen uh, the tremendous growth, uh, the phenomenal growth of uh, internet video uh, in the past uh, years. Um, first of all, the traditional TV uh, uh, viewing has dropped. Uh, uh, and why the online streaming has increased substantially. Uh, and we see that IP video has already accounted for most of the traffic in the internet nowadays. So uh, users actually are increasingly accessing videos uh, over the internet instead of over the cable. And internet video actually to, to all the way to TV. Now, nowadays we have the TV. The TV actually is talking to the internet and accessing the content from the internet. So the internet video to TV has grown also tremendously over the past few years. Uh, it's expected to continue to grow uh, many folds okay, by 2020. And uh, or what's more is that uh, increasingly mobile devices are uh, accessing uh, the internet uh, 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 video. Okay? Uh, so uh, that, will, uh, that actually accounts for two thirds of the total IP traffic by 2020. So you see that there's a phenomenal growth on internet video, and uh, nowadays we don't we usually sit at home watching the TV, okay, uh, but actually we are accessing the video okay, using our uh, devices. 
anyway, anytime. So uh, when we're talking about the challenges of uh, um, uh, internet video, then uh, there are several uh, great challenges. The first one is that a good video, a uh, good quality stream requires very high bandwidth. So uh, just to take an example, uh, um, you know, a HD quality video need about three megabit per second uh, streaming rates. With just uh, the, uh, with just uh, like one hundred thousand users, that requires three hundred gigabit per second bandwidth. That is actually a very steep requirement. Um, so uh, that is uh, uh, steep for server and also for, for the network point of view. So bandwidth is the critical issue to address uh, for the internet video, and uh, the internet is also the best effort. Right? Uh, it's the best effort network. There's no guarantee on bandwidth, no guarantee the packet will arrive in time and correctly. So uh, we need to address a lot of fault issues, loss issues. And video is also differentially coded so that streaming requires sustained bandwidth with very low loss. So uh, that is actually very important when we are talking about uh, large scale uh, internet uh, video broadcasting. So the traditional cloud broadcasting is like that. Uh, there's a video source, there's somewhere, okay, uh, that is uh, basically the source of the live stream. And it's going to distribute in the cloud, in the global cloud, uh, uh, using VMs or a cloud server. Uh, these VMs actually serve a local community. Right? So for example, in Singapore, right, there may be a couple of cloud servers here okay, so serving Singaporeans. So uh, the, uh, these cloud servers often uh, uh, you know, have limited streaming capacity and network bandwidth. So, uh, and it, uh, when the number of users or subscribers increases, uh, the server processing load would also correspondingly increase. So, uh, it also requires very costly server and network bandwidth, right, as the number of users increases. And an uh, expensive server farm and backbone network maintenance is also very, uh, uh, is, is also, uh, you know, um, getting unmanageable as the number of users increases uh, globally. So, um, we are uh, actually, my team is uh, trying to address the bottlenecks, the pain points for large scale internet video broadcasting. So, um, the first is to look at the network core. So, we look at the network core and uh, basically we see that uh, there's an insufficient and expensive core bandwidth to support tremendous number of stream flows. So, if you have, uh, so how can we scale up that? It is a very important problem. Um, so uh, we, uh, to that end, we are actually using multipath and substreaming, I will explain it a bit later, to achieve cost-effective core bandwidth management. So in terms of network edge, so uh, we actually uh, have uh, local VMs, have, uh, uh, we, uh, not local VMs have limited streaming capacity, so we use fog or edge computing to overcome this. So basically we are deploying fog routers and mobile P2P sharing so as to achieve uh, you know, scalability in our network. So I will basically explain okay, these two parts later on. This is the architecture we are talking about for uh, live streaming, <coughs> live video broadcasting. It is actually, uh, the name is called Streamfony. It's our technology name. It's a highly scalable uh, streaming platform. So uh, we have the video cam, right? Uh, this is the source, injecting live stream to a CDN cloud. The CDN cloud will distribute the stream globally using VMs, and, uh, and uh, devices may tap into these VMs to get stream. And furthermore, to scale up the edge, so we actually have a four uh, devices there, which is composed of routers, okay, uh, set top boxes, uh, and PCs, uh, stable devices, which form the four edge networking so as to stream to the uh, stream content to the other devices. So that scale up the capacity of the CDN cloud. So we are actually saving bandwidth in the core and also we are saving bandwidth for the VMs at the edge using the fork technology. So, um, uh, I was, uh, so basically the research goal is to build advanced streaming system driven by research innovations and designed by engineering excellence. So we, uh, we, uh, we tackle the problem from the research point of view and also engineering design point of view we develop the system so to address the curse of scale and uh, we would like to add, unleash the uh, research impact through technology entrepreneurship and transfers so we are transferring the technology to the industry right now and uh, we work with uh, we have been working with governments and industry to transfer and deploy the developed technologies so there are several uh, successful commercial cases and ventures already 
So uh, the, the uh, technology has uh, been awarded uh, gold medal, uh, gold award in Hong Kong ICT uh, award. So, um, so this technology is based on patent technology uh, coming from research. So uh, there are several important ingredients on these technologies. Uh, I will try to touch upon them uh, one by one in this uh, keynote. So the first is that uh, it is a CDN and P2P or cow plus fork technology. So uh, they basically uh, we augment fork uh, computing to the cloud to quickly scale up the uh, video broadcasting. Um, and also it is based on the optimized push. So it's a push based technology, it's not a pool based uh, video streaming technology. Uh, it's based on substreaming, meaning that uh, we, we subdivide the streams instead of using a full stream, we subdivide it so that this, this stream are distributed in the network in a multi path manner. And uh, we also uh, take advantage of IP multicasting wherever we, uh, uh, we, uh, we can enjoy it. So uh, this is a, uh, it's called scalable IP multicast. And we also look through uh, some efficient caching and storage mechanism uh, to quickly scale up this network. So the, the roadmap is like that. Uh, it's a three-party orchestration, the government, university, and industry. So I'm saying the university side, uh, to develop uh, this technology. So first of all, the government fund our research yeah, through some kind of matching fund with industry. So I get a dollar from the industry and the government will match up with a few dollars. And, uh, and the government also provides some internship program. And uh, my university, uh, I work with uh, the department, the school and the tech transfer center. So that's to transfer technology to the industry. And uh, they provide me with R&D facilities and uh, human resources, and of course students to do research. And uh, uh, they also provide me advices and support on contractual agreements. The, the industrial sponsor is the most important part of this uh, uh, project. Uh, we work with uh, leading uh, content providers, service providers, uh, and uh, so as to, uh, for them to provide funding and also tech, uh, tech support and trial sites and equipment. So this is the three-party orchestration uh, uh, in order to deliver, transfer the stream from the all the way to the industry. So um, that in the process, I'm trying, I'm, I am, you know, trying to close the theory practice gap. Um, it is a great divide. So uh, in theory, uh, in research, we often have fragility concerns, right? So um, we would like to see, so uh, we would uh, simplify the assumptions, uh, we limit the parameters so as to attractable performance. Uh, Oftentimes, they will lead to strong and optimal performance. However, in, uh, uh, in industry, what they are concerned more is the holistic approach, the systematic approach, the whole system. Uh, what do you have, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, DRM, right, uh, digital right management, do you have the management system, do you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, coding and all that, right, so it's a holistic approach, often characterized by unpredictable parameters, unpredictable network, con uh, uh, you know, environments, very complex interdependence parameters. So oftentimes when we take the theory to practice, a lot of research modes are failed. So uh, I'm trying to close the gap. There's a uh, big divide, so I'm going to sit in between these two and try to bridge the gap. So uh, my research is to bridge the research with the practice to close the feedback loop. So whatever we see here, we take back to the research, modify our assumptions, uh, you know, uh, so that we can address the real problem and then take it back to the uh, practice and keep trying, okay, until we have the best performance in the applications. So, um, so that is the methodology. So let me basically uh, talk about first of all the cloud, then fork. Okay, uh, we are focusing on this cloud, right? So it's addressing the core bandwidth issues. So the, the Streamfony cloud actually uh, is a software shoot for CDN enabling large scale high speed rates streaming over the global internet to all the way to desktop and mobiles. So it's a cloud, uh, we build up the VMs and then we want to save the core bandwidth. Uh, it concerns bandwidth by overcoming the core network bottlenecks and also support high quality video and low delay uh, for the users because live broadcasting actually concern is the delay, right? You don't want to have high source to user delay, so we would like to reduce that. So we would like to design the cloud architecture, the VMs access, so that they can um, achieve very low delay. 
It is an, uh, an advanced internet multimedia streaming cloud based on the research and has been deployed uh, by industry leaders for commercial use. Uh, so, uh, like uh, we work with China Mobile, Hong Kong Jockey Club, and, and etc., uh, and also some companies in China to deploy this technology globally. So, let me just briefly talk about the technology uh, using some analogy. So, uh, the traditional approach is that the upstream media is the flow is very large, just like uh, you have a video stream, which is like 3 megabits or even 5 megabits, right? That is a, is a high, uh, like extremely high quality video, probably up to 10 megabits per second. So, the stream is actually flowing from the source. But uh, as you go down, right, uh, hop by hop to the users, you go through a lot of network bottlenecks, uh, the core bandwidth splitting and all that. Uh, so, in the midstream, the stream has already been narrowed. Uh, so uh, when you go to the downstream, okay, you reduce your trigger. So, uh, so that, that means that um, we cannot push a lot of streams, high bitrate stream from the upstream all the way to the downstream because of the network uh, condition. There's a bottleneck, uh, network bottleneck. So at the client side, actually, the stream is very, uh, is very little. <clears throat> so that results in a very poor video quality. Right? The quality can be in terms of delay, uh, in terms of low resolution, uh, uh, buffering or stop playing, uh, unable to join the server, and all this problem comes right, because of the network uh, problem. So, of course, this is unsatisfactory when you look at the football match, right? you can hardly see the face and hardly see the ball. Right? I mean, this is actually unacceptable. So that's why we work with uh, Hong Kong Jockey Club, actually. Uh, it is doing uh, you know, some kind of horse racing. And that they have, that they, that they, one of the requirements okay, they give us is that you have to see the horse legs. Okay? The horse legs and the horse head. I mean, because when the horse is a horse, horse racing, when the horse is going through the finishing line, you have to clearly see the horse head crossing the finishing line and horse leg crossing the finishing line. So you cannot have this kind of fussy, uh, low quality video. So that's why uh, they're, uh, they're demanding very high quality video um, so it's all the way to the, to the users. So our approach is to use what we call substreaming. So we basically subdivide the stream into multiple substreams. So uh, let's say I'm working on 4 megabit per second, so I will subdivide the stream of 1 megabit per second with 4 substreams. So, uh, so these flows will flow in parallel overcoming the network bottleneck in multi-path manner. So, uh, so it is going to send the streams uh, uh, into, uh, uh, over the core network in multi-path manner, okay, all the way. So this is like a substreaming uh, uh, algorithm. So you break the streams up and then overcoming the network uh, bottleneck. So you push the substream down over the multiple paths, right? So this, uh, this uh, uh, over, uh, you go through the network, you go through the global internet, and uh, so this will uh, keep going. So at the end, you merge the stream. So uh, like at the VM, uh, at the end server, you basically uh, uh, pull all these substreams together, assemble the full stream before you serve the users. So, uh, so the, in this case, you enter the stream, so uh, the, you basically conserve the flow, and you no longer have this uh, low bandwidth problem. So that's called substream multipath delivery. Uh, so um, basically, a traditional one is that you push the 4 megabit per second down, downstream when you go to the uh, uh, proxy or uh, the cloud server uh, at, at the end host when you, uh, when you stream the users, uh, the single path delivery, uh, you only get very little streams remaining. But for our approach, you basically substreaming, you uh, and then you send it in parallel okay, over multiple parts, and then you assemble it at the end host. So uh, that is the uh, what we call substream multipath delivery. So you achieve four megabit per second at the client. So um, how is it compared? How uh, with the traditional approach on the random pool, right? Uh, oftentimes we, we look at the video streaming, right? Uh, the, like uh, they often, you know, based on the approach of pooling, right? You keep pooling, you keep grabbing the, the, the stream in the network, and eventually you lead to a congestion. So actually, this is a very well known problem. We are, we are looking at like a BT approach or a random pool approach for video streaming. 
but for our approach, it's called optimized approach. So uh, the substreams are pulling in a very orderly manner, overcoming the uh, network condition, a uh, network bottlenecks. So eventually, you, you will be assembled at the end host and serve the users. So this is called optimized push. It's more efficient and achieving higher bandwidth, uh, conserving network uh, bandwidth. So beyond that, we have also uh, uh, seamlessly integrate IP multicasting. So we have a mechanism to detect multicast ions in the internet. So when the, whenever we see the IP multicast domain, we actually will take advantage of it. So uh, every time we pass through a multicast domain, we will do multicasting. If we do not have multicasting, uh, we do not have multicasting, then we do you know this kind of uh, multi-path uh, uh, substream uh, 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 delivery. So in this case, we are able to quickly scale up the, our uh, uh, streaming uh, capacity and uh, improving our uh, the streaming efficiency. So we've got this driver here, the underlying cost driver, so cost is constantly falling. That's driving it. And understanding, once we've got this massive data set, what to do with it. Many companies fail to value that properly and or fail to use it. But the new entrants are coming in, capturing the data and using it in new ways to get new insights. So understanding the digital infrastructure is critical. And this brings us then through to the five core points here. Or four, sorry. The, the ubiquitous sensing. This notion I referred to that we're going to have, we predicted to have around a trillion sensors in the world by 2020. Sensors in cars, sensors on roads, sensors in aeroplanes, sensors in hospitals. But the key thing is that they're all going to be connected. And sometime in that next decade, they'll be talking to each other. 50 billion sensors, and we talk about the Internet of Things. It's just about to happen in ways that we haven't yet imagined. And there are companies that are going to exploit that opportunity in big ways. And that basically tells us that we've got connectivity. We've now got basically one, at least one mobile device for every human being on Earth. We can get a, a pad or something and see that technology right in front of us. We can be connected to everything on the planet. And that's transformative. We've got the connectors and the intra interoperability software. So the architecture is letting us cross boundaries. I talk to my students in China. Oh, they say, we can't do that. And then I say, oh, yeah, but we've got little ways of getting across that barrier because the Chinese government tries to sanction the Western web in various ways. So the, the, way, the ways that we build, build walls, and Stephen had that example. We had a wall in the middle of our room before. We cross it all the time. The students can do it every day. So if they can do it, I'm sure the business world has ways that inter interoperable connectivity. And then we've got this whole world of big data out there. Once all this is connected, we know everything about everybody and we know everything about everything. That can all be pulled together. That's the world. Now, that could be a big scary world, a big brother world or something, a George Orwell in. Future, but it's, it's right there, right there now. So that's the question, are you ready for it? Are you going to walk that step or are you going to fall down? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to cross that bridge, get into the, in, the, the this, is, this is a transition moment in history. I can see it before my eyes. And my kids often ask me, what kind of job will I do? Should I be studying this? And I really can't, I can't see all the way up here, but I know, I know this is here. This, this crack is happening. And you can see it in front of our eyes. So how do we try and span that bridge? Well, this is just giving you a, 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 I guess a, a model to set. But we've got an accelerated time, time frame. So most people today are going to have to set their own business. We talk about that. The large organizations are not going to be around in the future, or they're going to be around much smaller. So even the big companies today, like Facebook, Google, Apple, the 
biggest, most valuable companies, according to the New York or, or, or NASDAQ, don't have as, anywhere near as many employees as the big companies did a few years ago. The jobs aren't there in the really big companies. But there is lots of wealth to be achieved. So businesses or, or people getting into startups have to work through this sort of model. You need this vision, envisaging some end state, then moving along the top, where, how are you going to get there, and, and then going through getting the technology and then moving that very fast because the cycle is moving quicker all the time. And everyone tells us that whenever we look at the robotics industry. The, the pace, because the uh, ROS, the ro robot operating system that was developed at Stanford, is, is it's, that, 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 uh, it's a bit like the, the, the uh, disk operating system that Microsoft had, but ROS is the robotic operating system. It's open, open architect software. So people all around the world are using that. We've got this, this, um, this massive change in robotics and particularly in algorithms that are driving this. And the, and the computing systems today are, are becoming much better at self-learning. And all of that's transforming uh, industry. So when we do that, what are we get, going to learn? We've got to identify customer pain points. Where is there a problem at the moment? And again, I can't foresee that. If I did, I'd be sitting on a corporate board on, on more of those. But we can look at an example. And the TV companies, and they still do that, they bundle up a whole pile of programs and sell them to their customers. Most people only ever look at part of that bundle. There may be documentaries, movies, sports channels, etc. So what we've got are all the online content providers, Netflix and others, finding out people can pick, I just want that. They've now got ways to, to People don't want all the services some companies try to sell them as a bundle. That's an example of giving, again, consumer power, consumers what they want. Change your decision making model. A lot of companies spend all, all the time analysing their past performance and data. That's not going to give you the answers for tomorrow. But people are very cautious. A lot of business managers, oh, I don't want to lose my job, but better take very careful decision making. Particularly in big companies, they're under a lot of performance bon performance targets and bonuses based their, their, their income is based on that. But decision making in the future is going to be a lot more subjective. If you're going to be anticipatory, we don't know the outcomes. We've got to take our best judge judgments. We've got to take that insight and try and understand what's going on in the market. Who are the disruptors and where are they coming from? Identify the way that uh, we create new value for our consumers. And also to transition businesses constantly while keeping in place. And I use Netflix as a game because it, it was originally a DVD distribution company that went into a streaming company. It kept its DVD business but wound it out and, and evolved a new business on top of that. And we see the really good companies, and that's another example. Getting old businesses, but keeping them going and then closing them down, moving on, closing. And that's uh, a challenge. So some good examples there. The response. You're in an environment that is being responsive. Uh, or, or subject to a lot of disruptive, and how do you respond uh, as, as a decision maker? The best case studies all tell us you, there is a huge underassessment. People don't really see the little guy, the little company, the new technology, and what it may do. They don't share the vision of the entrepreneur, and so what we've got is this massive underestimation. And again, a great example is the BlackBerry Company. At one point, the biggest uh, in the US anyway, uh, provider of uh, telephone technology, completely wiped out. So, big guy can be wiped out quite easily, and iPhone came along. And an iPhone's 
constantly under threat by Samsung and Androids and things like that. So pressure is on. Even if you are a disruptor, someone else is going to try and get back at you. The basically, the point here is companies can be late then. If they've denied it, they can be late, late to recognize it. They don't realize that the disruption is occurring until it's too late to respond. And so a great example of holding on to old technology is Sony. Sony was way ahead of everybody, also in the digital space, but it kept investing in its Walkmans and lost lots and lots of money. Sony as a corporation still survived, but it didn't, even though it could do all that stuff, it didn't apply itself and didn't move quickly into that uh, music player space that, that the Apple iPod and others came in and quickly replaced the Walkmans in. And if you're, if you're a big company and you do get disruptive, well, and what we see a lot in, 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 in the big Silicon Valley is they're constantly buying the new startups and then you've got another billionaire and buy another one and they pay big money if they think that the disruptive technology is potentially worthwhile. A lot of the times that they, the big companies can try and squeeze that technology out. But an example is Avis acquiring Zipcar. And that kept Zipcar on, again, one of these mobile apps to complement its existing car rental uh, business model. Now, out of all that is the, is the real buzzword today, which is new category creation. Everybody wants to create the new category. Not just get a new product, but invent the whole, the whole model. And that's, that's what everyone in, in Silicon Valley is after. They want new category creation. They don't want just another product or an upgrade or an iPhone version 6.7 or 7, 8 or 9 or whatever number they're up to. They want a whole new, maybe an X phone, some other category. So the example I'll put here is, is, is a, it's been used before by others, but it, it's in surfing. And I'm a surfer because I come from the Gold Coast in Australia. And we have a very famous guy in Hawaii called Laird Hamilton. And he decided to get a surfboard and stick it behind a jet ski. And he created a whole new category of surfing called toe surfing. And it, of course, is a whole new category of sport. And as you, if you've looked at some of the Olympic Games recently, <laughs> this new sport's getting added all the time. New people developing new ways. That's a, a way to think about new category creation, doing something new, maybe combining some existing technologies but putting it together in a new way so it becomes a complete new category. Now, a great example is how do you create new categories and, and the big buzzword is electric cars is, is really important at the moment moving forward. Replacing the fossil, the oil based car industry and Tesla's moving in that but what do they do? Well, it's all about electric cars. The brand is not that important in the beginning, it's creating the category and we understand a lot of companies invest a lot of time building their category before building their brand, uh, particular brand up. And then building consumer loyalty, the brand advocates about this new brand and they tend to be uh, driving that brand process. And a lot, of, a lot of this today is with open networks and sharing driven through that technology. So we can see this sort of model here. Get a, 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 pain, a pain point, disrupt, evolve quickly, converge, and then rethink, reimagine the category. So that's the sort of step, and it's usually done fairly quickly, but people have got to have that vision. That's the thing that's going to take them forward. Now the one that I mentioned earlier, and it's my own area because I'm, I'm an accountant and, and I'm interested in the financial market, I spent a lot of time reading about financial technology because that seems to be the big thing. I called it FinTech, financial technology. And the FinTech buzzword is all about disrupting this huge industry. And that's, Singapore has a big FinTech hub, London, New York. New York's got the biggest FinTech hub in the world. But a lot of that's driven out of Silicon Valley technology, but it's being invested in Europe. And Sydney, Australia, wants to be a fintech hub in Australia. So what are we trying to do there? Trying to understand all of these different places, payment systems, 
uh, pricing, product comparison. We've got lots of websites now that can quickly tell you which deal is the best for your mortgage, for your insurance, whatever. All of this kind of technology is out there. So we've got a lot of startup companies. We've got the traditional guys trying to redefine their industry. What's, where's banking and finance and insurance? We've got regulators who don't really know what to do with all this because it's happening too quickly. So a lot of governments around the world are struggling to keep up with all of this that's going on. Mobile banking, insurance, personal finance. All of this is, 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 this is moving on at a very, very rapid rate. So it's estimated there's more than 2,000 fintech startups globally right now. And there's a lot of money being poured into this. 23 billion last year in US venture capital alone. Uh, uh, an example, PayPal, you've got Apple Pay, Alipay, all the big payment. The payments area is one that's really attracted a lot of attention to start with. But there's a whole lot of other stuff. Account management, security, uh, one of the big issues again in banking is a lot of people are very trusting of their banks and they're very reluctant to move a lot of money. So customer, customer shifting in banking is pretty slow. It's historically one of the most conservative areas of human uh, consumer behavior is the banking and finance industry, but it's moving. But the big threat, and that one that I love, is Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg. He said he knows more about every one of his 1.5 billion Facebook customers than any bank in the world knows about his customers. The banks go through their credit, your credit rating, they give you a score, and then they'll lend you some money. Mark Zuckerberg, he knows whether he can really trust you. Oh. Oh. Sorry. I got carried away there, but anyway, it's gone off. Anyway, the uh, Mark Zuckerberg sort of argues, was there a way to get that back onto a yeah, question? Thanks, yeah. Must have uh, grabbed the wrong thing in my enthusiasm talking about but th that's the whole point that that a company that's outside traditional oh, yeah it's come back great thank you very much um, he will disrupt the banking he, you know facebook is a complete outsider never done any banking in the world but all of a sudden they're talking about going into consumer loans with their customers that will be massive if that happens and i read a, a piece recently that Mark Zuckerberg said, I have only done 1%. Facebook has only done 1% of its disruptions. He said, I've got this vision ahead. Now, this is one that he's talked about, and presumably later this year or early next year, you'll see Facebook offering consumer credit. Now, there's a whole lot of banks running quickly, trying to protect their space here, because as I said, there's this is the biggest prize in the global economy, is, is the profits and money in the banking system. So the key, there's a lot of, a lot of issues in, in financial uh, technology. The banks have a lot of data on their customers. They haven't probably used it well. And they can go back and data mine that. Facebook's doing that. With, because Facebook, when you sign up to a Facebook account, they own everything that's on that. So they, they, you've already given them permission to use that. Whether that you've given the banks all the permissions to use all the data they have on you, they may have to relook at their uh, customer uh, integrity policies and things like that. So focusing in on individual wealth management, developing better understanding of the needs of customers in the banking system and uh, basically guaranteeing security, building this uh, you know, secure cyber security uh, and running organizations efficiently. That's how the banks will survive. So we've got uh, some lessons from all of that. I'm just coming to an end now, so thank you for your patience. But what I, I mentioned at the beginning, what has been described by some as the most important document ever written in America, apart from the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, is Netflix's Statement of Culture. So you can actually, that's a web link to that. 
and, and some in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's a bit of California hype, but it's, it's a PowerPoint series. And uh, Reed, who's the, the CEO of Netflix, put this together, and it's driven their culture. And their culture is all about high performance. And while we've got the Olympics here, uh, 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 aligns Netflix to the US Olympic team. And he said, if you're an Olympian and you get selected to represent your country, you don't expect to be on the Olympic team forever. You're only on that team while you are the best. And likewise, if you want to be on Netflix team, you have to be the best. And once you've been on Netflix team, even if it's for three years, five years, and you moved on, you can then say, I was on Netflix, I was the best in those few years. So this is, is a, a core uh, idea behind Netflix and behind its remuneration, behind its values, its integrity. So ultimately, in a, in a very disruptive world, it's your employees, the talent you have in your company that's going to help you survive. So you've got to empower your people. and be prepared to constantly redeploy. If you're not redeploying, and there's a whole lot of financial measures, they look at capital recycling and capital renewal, and we can look at some of these analytics to get behind that. But that's the idea. We want to see companies re revising themselves. And again, we can look at some case studies. Clearly, Fuji versus Kodak. One company survived the move to digital camera imaging, and the other company did. So adapt or perish, there's a few names of companies that didn't get there. So it's ultimately a mindset. Keep away from groupthink. Companies do get into that. There's a lot of evidence of that. You eliminate these silos and power structures because that, in particularly in big companies, it, it seem, seems to contribute to corporate failure. And always look outside where you traditionally are. Reinvent your company, reinvent. So the, the surviving companies tend to do that. So here's my little summary of what I think you can learn and how you respond to digital disruption. And it's not that complex, really. Ultimately, you've got to have a vision. If you don't have a vision, well, we can go, have, go to the coffee shop and drink coffee or do something. But if you've got a vision, you're going to go out there and head towards this win-win sort of situation. Build the culture. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of organizational culture. A lot of my academic research has been in, in culture, in national cultures, organizational cultures, and how groups respond. And, and we can look at and we can learn lots of lessons. And what but what, what we get told from the research literature is once you get a court organization's culture in place, it's extremely hard to ever change it. And particularly in startups, and the first thing the venture capitalists do in Silicon Valley is get the culture in the company before there are 10 employees. Because what they say is once you go beyond 10, your culture is fixed. You've got to get it right at the beginning. You've got to be agile. Once you've got that, you've got to be constantly adapting and be prepared to not stay with the old. Don't stick with these nostalgic strategies. Oh, we've done that for a few years or, you know, whatever. It's not going to keep you in business. And as we learn from Netflix and others, the best companies are going to have the best and brightest people working for them. So getting that talent, making it, making your company the best in the world, your organization the best, is the, is the way to survive in this disruptive environment. It may not guarantee you survival, but it will give you a chance to survive. And if you want to be kept in the old bowl, you don't adapt. If you want to get out here, get into the future, you've got to jump out of the old swimming pool. Do something completely new. So that's uh, my lessons on disruption. I find it uh, a fascinating area. I, as I said earlier, I don't have all the answers but I know it's right in front of me. It's right there, and I'm doing my best to try and adapt as quickly as I can to this new world. It's very exciting. It's a great opportunity for us all. I think Stephen mentioned that earlier. The opportunities are there. 
but there's also a lot of risk. And we've got to be prepared to take some of those risks. They may not all pay off. But thank you very much for your attention this morning, and I'm happy to take some questions if we've got some, some time. Interests, yeah. and I just wonder to what to what extent states and governments and vested interests are going with this, or actually trying to disrupt the disruption. I think your second point is more to the same because I saw an example I just given. It's a very simple one. Just a newspaper column this morning about the Prime Minister of Singapore saying how he's going to protect the taxi industry to protect those who are being disrupted by Uber and some of the other uh, apps. Now, I see a lot of governments around the world being reactive. This is, this is unknown territory because the future is predict uh, uh, predictably scary. What kind of jobs are we going to have if these robotics and interconnectivity occur? It's going to be massive transformation. It's not going to be just in the traditional manufacturing industries, but a lot of the service sector industries we take for granted today are going to change or change rapidly or be re possibly replaced by... Um, by some kind of robot. And we see that whether it's driverless cars. There won't be pilots in aeroplanes in 20 years' time, I guarantee that. The US Air Force has most of its Air Force fleet flown by robots now. It's less than 50% of the total US Air Force fleet of the, 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 the military. It's mostly, we call, you know, drones or, or whatever. But these are getting more powerful all the time. Now, will that, how will that transition now? You know, and how will we as consumers, when we get on a plane, when we know this is just a, a robot or a computer or somebody sitting in an office somewhere that's controlling a computer that flies the airplane when we want to come to Singapore for the next conference? But the day in the future will come very soon when it possibly won't be. And when someone offers you a cup of tea in the aisle or a snack, it'll be a robot. They're already delivering pizzas and things. So. There are certainly yeah. dangers in that because one of my doctoral students is doing her PhD on, on uh, safety in the, in the airline industry mm. and what she says is most planes are flown by computers. Mm. When yeah. you take off and you land it's computers doing it. Right? The, the crew are just sitting there. Right? Mm. But sometimes the technology goes wrong. Yeah. And she said that what then happens is all their training kicks in and they sort mm. it out except when they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, again, that's the, the, certainly the case, and uh, certainly with medical imaging, imaging and, and diagnostics, a lot, of that, a lot of that's all done now. You go to your surgeon or your uh, health professional or whatever to get some advice. It's all the computer works around and tells them this is what's going on. They'll read all your x-rays and do all, and it all comes back to you. And, and, the, and that's all about this connectivity, and, and certainly with the human genome. Everybody's gene around the world can be compared identically. It's all the technology that bank, they can go, and that's all done in a matter of milliseconds. The billions of people, all, all that database of, of individual. So, you know, there's a huge wealth of information, and that's all available then to either a computer to decide, decide what to do, or a human who can then get all that information and have that presented to them. So, we have much more powerful decision making potential as individuals, but we also could be you know, this is the big fear, replaced. <laughs> and so that, that's the future of work debate that, that Stephen alluded to. And, and it's a big debate everywhere in the world as we envisage the future. Who's going to, and, and the, in the financial services industry, 80 or 90% of the, the funds management now, is, it's all algorithm. You, you, you think you might be speaking to a, a, it's a, it's a, a voice at the other end that's not human, <laughs> sounds human, telling you how to invest your pension fund or whatever. It's, but they worked out your wealth strategy, your position in life, and compared you to the spectrum, and bang, this is the, the financial advice that you get. And only very, very rarely will the humans get involved. All the big trading funds are all digitally programmed. Uh, it's, there's, there's a little bit of human oversight if they think something's going wrong, but the basic programs for all the big hedge funds are all driven by algorithms. The people don't do that much, you know, fine tuning on the on the, on the day by day or microsecond by microsecond that these things trade at.
I don't know that answered your question, but it just threw off. I think governments really yeah, haven't got the answers yet. They haven't thought through how significant these changes are. And I don't know if groups like Stephen Cedar are asking the question, but I think a lot of groups are reactive, not, not wanting to, you know, and, but the, I think Singapore is a good example of a country that's trying, you know, one of the better countries looking forward. Maybe the UK, certainly the US, but, uh, you know, we'll see, not necessarily politically, but there's a very strong private sector that's been reinventing itself there. Um, and we see even in Germany, you know, the so-called reshoring. So a lot of European, particularly German, companies are bringing back to, to Germany because it's all going to be ro robotic manufacturing, same as the US. They're reshoring at a massive rate. And that's going to be the big thing. And, the, and, and, and Australia, as a country, in my country, we sort of say we're expecting to benefit from the Asian century. But the Asian century was predicated on this belief that it's going to provide a lot of services to the developed world, particularly the US and Europe. That may not happen because these places will reshore most of their industry that they had exported in the 60s, 70s and 80s. They're all going to come back on board. There's different jobs because the, the, the particularly um, ma the manufacturing sectors are all going to be done by robots, but there's all still a lot of distribution, but maybe that's driverless cars and trucks. And, but there'll be people, there's a whole lot of new jobs that'll be supporting this new kind however, of economy. However, okay, sorry. Yeah, you, yeah, I, 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 you got a bit of a crystal ball, have you no, seen No, 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 it's just yeah. that, you know, um, I look at what happened in Australia on the evening of the 9th of, uh, of August. Uh, it was census time in Australia, mm. and we were all told to go online to fill in the census information. Guess what? The, the computer crashed. Why? Because some boy somewhere was able to infiltrate IBM's computer system, was able to send it into orbit. Yep. So, look, at the end of the day, all of the disruption, disruption comes in many forms. And mm. so let's not believe that, the, you know, that it's all going to be the be-all and end-all. Around the government support as well, again, you know, picking up a couple of points there, uh, it is true that governments looking at uh, outsourcing and so on, greater use of computer technology and delivery of benefits and whatever it might be, because it takes out something of the human element and that face-to-face -face having to deal with people. But the fastest growing, in my view, the fastest growing industry that's going to come through digital disruption is going to be the legal profession. Because if you're in a driverless car and you happen to run someone over, whose fault is it? <laughs> Who can you sue? Can you sue the driverless car? There isn't a driver in it. Do you, do you, can you sue the, the person that's got the, the camera technology that's around? Maybe not. Who's actually programmed where you've got to go? Is it IBM or is it somebody else? So the fastest growing profession in the world is going to be the legal profession. If you're telling your kids what to be, I reckon start to study digital law. There you go. There's a tip. <laughs> okay. I'll go, go re-educate my children now. Thanks, Stephen. Any, any other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, do you know who, do you reflect on the stuff kind of issues in your own country, in your own environment? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. I mean, I think the UK is quite sports of this. We're talking about certain like, uh, cultures being very supportive of this sort of disruption. Like, so, see, we've had a lot of changes with um, support for Amazon recently in the UK, so they can now fly drones below yeah, certain yeah. levels. So, that's kind of uh, facilitating those that are under an hour delivery kind of idea that mm. Bozos has got. Yep. But yeah, that's a, that's a, like, and that's another interesting point is the, is the need for a lot of legal, whether it's not only the, the, the contestable law, but, yeah, but it's the legal they, frameworks they, in which technology I mean, is made, operating. Uh, they, they, you know, they've uh, said that for this particular time, they're going to actually uh, dispense with some of the uh, formalities of the laws to do with mm -hmm. this sort of thing as well. And there's been, uh, you yeah, know, it's very interesting. Yeah, we've had, I've been involved in a couple of drone companies in Australia and or drone or UAV companies we call them, unmanned vehicle. But the whole, the, a lot of the issues there, uh, and we've had CASA, which is our Civil Aviation Safety Authority in Australia, uh, review all of, all of its regulations in the last couple of years, again trying to, to free up this space for the possible use in a whole range of different applications, from you know, monitoring infrastructure, agriculture, 
safety. We've just the, one of the groups I'm involved with is, is the surfing and surf life saving. And this year we've just uh, we're, we're in the process. And this year we'll have uh, uh, drones that have uh, uh, deployable life saving vests. And so and they'll have GPS trackers. They've got everything. They can find the person who is in, in an ocean or a difficult situation. Drop safety gear to them. Have that all monitored before human intervention, so they get this done really quickly. So it's, it's a lot of win-wins possibly out of this. It's not just things like that. In the UK as well, I know there's been big moves. I mean, it's quite a while now ago since, um, I mean, there isn't any driverless cars in the UK, but the legislation's in place yeah, to I've put it in place. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, you know, we're talking about sort of changes in business models as well there, but like, uh, you know, there's like, at the same time we're talking about driverless cars, but we're also talking at the way in which, uh, like, uh, the car industry, is being disrupted as well. This kind of moves mm -hmm. are there away from sort of ownership almost into sort of. Well, that's the other side of that is you know having have like an Airbnb for cars. So yeah, you know, exactly. cars I mean, and car pools. And I mean, I think that's kind one. of starting to sort of yeah. emerge a bit now, really. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So yeah, the, the whole and, and then you've got like Tesla coming in, replacing with electronic and sustainable vehicles, uh, to the traditional petrol, um, you know. Car, you know, carbon-based sort of fuel system. So a lot of change going on in the auto. In the auto industry, is going to be a big one. But the other side of that is is the, the capacity of drones and the connectivity there. And where I see those things, the drones are getting stronger and better, and and it won't. You know, they'll be emerging because everyone's envisaged since I was a boy of you, you sort of being able to jump in and fly, not having to sit in the car and drive on the ground. Now that drone and the auto vehicle industry is probably not too far away. You know, probably in the next decade. We're going to see drone, the drones, well certainly they can lift big payloads now, but that the capacity of DJI Industries, the big Chinese drone manufacturer, probably the leader, are, are going to lift you know, 30, 50, 100 kilo packages. That's a human being. You can just sit in your drone, bang, off to work. You don't even need a vehicle. Now that's going to happen probably within this next 20, uh, 10 years, I mean, 2025, something like that, 26. That will be... It will be will be in the, in those in those drones with that kind of pack, and they'll be solar powered. We've already flown around the world indefinitely in solar flight, so solar flight powered flight is, is not far away. Anyway, I, I, I read a lot about the future. I've been told my future's just ended. <laughs> but it's been a pleasure talking with you uh, today, and I'll be here all day, um, obviously to to talk with you more uh, over coffee. And thank you very much. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Associate Professor Michael Chow. He's from School of Business, Faculty of Business and Economics from the University of Hong Kong. Yeah. So we've got this driver here, the underlying cost driver, so cost is constantly falling. That's driving it. And understanding once we've got this massive data set, what to do with it. Many companies fail to value that properly and or fail to use it. But the new entrants are coming in, capturing the data and using it in new ways to get new insights. So understanding the digital infrastructure is critical. This brings us then through to the five core points here. Or four, sorry. The, the ubiquitous sensing. This notion I referred to that we're going to have, we predicted to have around a trillion sensors in the world by 2020. Sensors in cars, sensors on roads, sensors in aeroplanes, sensors in hospitals. But the key thing is that they're all going to be connected. And sometime in that next decade, they'll be talking to each other. 50 billion sensors, and we talk about the Internet of Things. It's just about to happen in ways that we haven't yet imagined. And there are companies that are going to exploit that opportunity in big ways. And that basically tells us that we've got connectivity. We've now got basically one, at least one mobile device for every human being on Earth. We can get a, a pad or something and see that technology right in front of us. We can be connected to everything on the planet. And that's transformative. We've got the connectors and the intra interoperability software. So the architecture is letting us cross boundaries. I talk to my students in China. Oh, they say, we can't do that. And then I say, oh, yeah, but we've got little ways of getting across that barrier because the Chinese government 
tries to sanction the Western web in various ways. So the, the, way, the ways that we build, build walls, and Stephen had that example, we had a wall in the middle of our room before, we cross it all the time. The students can do it every day. So if they can do it, I'm sure the business world has ways that inter interoperable connectivity. And then we've got this whole world of big data out there. Once all this is connected, we know everything about everybody, and we know everything about everything. That can all be pulled together. That's the world. Now, that could be a big scary world, a big brother world, or something in George Orwell in the future, but it's, it's right there, right there now. So that's the question. Are you ready for it? Are you going to walk that step, or are you going to fall down? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to cross that bridge, get into the it, the, the, this, is, this is a transition moment in history. I can see it before my eyes. And my kids often ask me, what kind of job will I do? Should I be studying this? And I really can't, I can't see all the way up here. But I know, I know this is here. This, this crack is happening. And you can see it in front of our eyes. So how do we try and span that bridge? Well, this is just giving you a, 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 I guess a, a model to set. But we've got an accelerated time, time frame. So most people today are going to have to set their own business. We talk about that. The large organizations are not going to be around in the future. Or they're going to be around much smaller. So even the big companies today, like Facebook, Google, Apple, the biggest, most valuable companies, according to the New York or, or, or NASDAQ, don't have as, anywhere near as many employees as the big companies did a few years ago. The jobs aren't there in the really big companies. But there is lots of wealth to be achieved. So businesses or, or people getting into startups have to work through this sort of model. You need this vision, envisaging some end state, then moving along the top. Where, how are you going to get there? and then going through getting the technology and then moving that very fast because the cycle is moving quicker all the time. And everyone tells us that whenever we look at the robotics industry. The, the pace, because the uh, ROS, the ro robot operating system that was developed at Stanford, is, is it's, that, 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 uh, it's a bit like the, the, the uh, disk operating system that Microsoft had, but ROS is the robotic operating system. It's open, open architect software. So people all around the world are using that. We've got this, this, um, this massive change in robotics and particularly in algorithms that are driving this. And the, and the computing systems today are, are becoming much better at self-learning. And all of that's transforming uh, industry. So when we do that, what are we get, we're going to learn? We've got to identify customer pain points. Where is there a problem at the moment? And again, I can't foresee that. If I did, I'd be sitting on a corporate board on, on more of those. But we can look at an example. And the TV companies, and they still do that, they bundle up a whole pile of programs and sell them to their customers. Most people only ever look at part of that bundle, and maybe documentaries, movies, sports channels, etc. So what we've got are all the online content providers, Netflix and others, finding it, people can pick, I just want that. They've now got ways to, to, people don't want all the services, some companies try to sell them as a bundle. That's an example of giving, again, consumer power, consumers what they want. Change your decision-making model. A lot of companies spend all, all the time analysing their past performance and data. That's not going to give you the answers for tomorrow. But people are very cautious. A lot of business managers, oh, I don't want to lose my job. We better take very careful decision-making, particularly in big companies. They're under a lot of performance, bon performance targets and bonuses based on their, their, their income is based on that. But decision-making in the future is going to be a lot more subjective. 
if you're going to be anticipatory, we don't know the outcomes. We've got to take our best judge judgments. We've got to take that insight and try and understand what's going on in the market. Who are the disruptors and where are they coming from? Identify the way that uh, we create new value for our consumers and also to transition businesses constantly while keeping in place. And I use Netflix as a game because it, it was originally a DVD distribution company that went into a streaming company. It kept its DVD business but wound it out and, and evolved a new business on top of that. And we see the really good companies, and that's another example, getting old businesses but keeping them going and then closing them down, moving on, closing. And that's uh, a challenge. So some good examples there. The response. You're in an environment that is being responsive. Uh, or, or subject to a lot of disruptive and how do you respond uh, as, as a decision maker. The best case studies all tell us you, there is a huge under assessment. People don't really see the little guy, the little company, the new technology and what it may do. They don't share the vision of the entrepreneur and so what we've got is this massive underestimation and again a great example is the BlackBerry Company. At one point, the biggest uh, in the US anyway, uh, provider of uh, telephone technology, completely wiped out. So, big guy can be wiped out quite easily. An iPhone came along, and an iPhone's constantly under threat by Samsung and Androids and things like that. So, pressure is on. Even if you are a disruptor, someone else is going to try and get back at you. The basically the point here is companies can be late then. If they've denied it, they can be late, late to recognize it. They don't realize that the disruption is occurring until it's too late to respond. And so a great example of holding on to old technology is Sony. Sony was way ahead of everybody, also in the digital space, but it kept investing in its Walkmans and lost lots and lots of money. Sony as a corporation still survived, but it didn't, even though it could do all that stuff, it didn't apply itself and didn't move quickly into that uh, music player space that, that the Apple iPod and others came in and quickly replaced the Walkmans in. And if you're, if you're a big company and you do get disrupted, well, and what we see a lot in, 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 in the big Silicon Valley is they're constantly buying the new startups and then you've got another billionaire buy another one and they pay big money if they think that the disruptive technology is potentially worthwhile. A lot of the times that they, the big companies can try and squeeze that technology out. But an example is Avis acquiring Zipcar and that kept Zipcar on. Again, one of these mobile apps to complement its existing car rental uh, business model. Now, out of all that is the, is the real buzzword today, which is new category creation. Everybody wants to create the new category. Not just get a new product, but invent the whole, the whole model. And that's, that's what everyone in, in Silicon Valley is after. They want new category creation. They don't want just another product or an upgrade or an iPhone version 6.7 or 7, 8 or 9, whatever number they're up to. They want a whole new, maybe an expo, some other category. So the example I'll put here is, is, is a, it's been used before by others, but it, it's in surfing. And I'm a surfer because I come from the Gold Coast in Australia. And we have a very famous guy in Hawaii called Laird Hamilton. And he decided to get a surfboard and stick it behind a jet ski. And he created a whole new category of surfing called toe surfing. And it, of course, is a whole new category of sport. And as you, if you've looked at some of the Olympic Games recently, <laughs> there's new sports getting added all the time. New people developing new ways. That's a, a way to think about new category creation, doing something new, maybe combining some existing technologies but putting it together in a new way. So it becomes a complete new category. Now, 
good. A great example is how do you create new categories? And, and the big buzzword is electric cars is, is really important at the moment, moving forward. Replacing the fossil, the oil-based car industry. And Tesla's moving in that. But what do they do? Well, it's all about electric cars. The brand is not that important in the beginning. It's creating the category. And we understand a lot of companies invest a lot of time building their category before building their brand, uh, particular brand up. And then building consumer loyalty, the brand advocates, about this new brand. And they tend to be uh, driving that brand process. And a lot, of, a lot of this today is with open networks and sharing driven through that technology. So we can see this sort of model here. Get a, 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 pain, a pain point, disrupt, evolve quickly, converge, and then rethink, reimagine the category. So that's the sort of step, and it's usually done fairly quickly, but people have got to have that vision. That's the thing that's going to take them forward. Now, the one that I mentioned earlier, and it's my own area because I'm, a, I'm an accountant and, and I'm interested in the financial market, I spent a lot of time reading about financial technology because that seems to be the big thing. Called it fintech, financial technology. And the fintech buzzword is all about disrupting this huge industry. And that's, Singapore has a big fintech hub, London, New York. New York's got the biggest fintech hub in the world. But a lot of that's driven out of Silicon Valley technology, but it's been invested in Europe. And Sydney, Australia, wants to be a fintech hub in Australia. So what are we trying to do there? Trying to understand all of these different places, payment systems, uh, pricing, product comparison. We've got lots of websites now that can quickly tell you which deal is the best for your mortgage, for your insurance, whatever. All of this kind of technology is out there. So we've got a lot of startup companies, we've got the traditional guys trying to redefine their industry, what's, where's banking and finance and insurance, we've got regulators who don't really know what to do with all this because it's happening too quickly, so a lot of governments around the world are struggling to keep up with all of this that's going on, mobile, banking, insurance, personal finance, all of this is, 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 this is moving along at a very, very rapid rate. So, it's estimated there's more than 2,000 fintech startups globally right now, and there's a lot of money being poured into this. 23 billion last year in US venture capital alone. Uh, an example, PayPal, you've got Apple Pay, Alipay, all the big payment. The payments area is one that's really attracted a lot of attention to start with. But there's a whole lot of other stuff, account management, security, uh, one of the big issues again in banking is a lot of people are very trusting of their banks and they're very reluctant to move a lot of money. So customer, customer shifting in banking is pretty slow. It's historically one of the most conservative areas of human uh, consumer behaviour is the banking and finance industry, but it's moving. But the big threat, and that one that I love, is Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg. He said he knows more about every one of his 1.5 billion Facebook customers than any bank in the world knows about his customers. The banks go through their credit, your credit rating, they give you a score, and then they'll lend you some money. But Mark Zuckerberg, he knows whether he can really trust you. Oh. Oh. Sorry. I got carried away there, but anyway, it's gone off. Anyway, the, uh, Mark Zuckerberg sort of argues, was there a way to get that back onto a yeah, question? Thanks, yeah, must have uh, grabbed the wrong thing in my enthusiasm talking about. But th that's the whole point, that, that a company that's outside traditional, oh, yep, it's come back, great, thank you very much. Um, he will disrupt the banking. He, you know, Facebook is a complete outsider. Never done any banking in the world. But all of a sudden, they're talking about going into consumer loans with their customers. That will be massive if that happens. And I read a, a piece recently that Mark Zuckerberg said, I have only done 1%. Facebook has only done 1% of its disruptions 
he said, I've got this vision ahead. Now, this is one that he's talked about, and presumably later this year or early next year, you'll see Facebook offering consumer credit. Now, there's a whole lot of banks running quickly trying to protect their space here, because as I said, this, this is the biggest prize in the global economy, is, is the profits and money in the banking system. So the key, there's a lot of, a lot of issues in, in financial uh, technology. The banks have a lot of data on their customers. They haven't probably used it well. And they can go back and data mine that. Facebook's doing that. With, because Facebook, when you sign up to a Facebook account, they own everything that's on that. So they, they, you've already given them permission to use that. Whether that you've given the banks all the permissions to use all the data they have on you, they may have to relook at their uh, customer uh, integrity policies and things like that. So focusing in on individual wealth management, developing better understanding of the needs of customers in the banking system and uh, basically guaranteeing security, building this uh, you know, secure cyber security uh, and running organisations efficiently. That's how the banks will survive. So we've got uh, some lessons from all of that. I'm just coming to an end now, so thank you for your patience. But what I, I mentioned at the beginning, what has been described by some as the most important document ever written in America, apart from the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, is Netflix's Statement of Culture. So you can actually, that's a web link to that. And, and some in Silicon Valley, I mean it's a bit of California hype, but it's, it's a PowerPoint series. And uh, Reid, who's the, the CEO of Netflix, put this together and it's driven their culture. And their culture is all about high performance. And while we've got the Olympics here, uh, 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 aligns Netflix to the US Olympic team. And he said, if you're an Olympian and you get selected to represent your country, you don't expect to be on the Olympic team forever. You're only on that team while you are the best. And likewise, if you want to be on Netflix team, you have to be the best. And once you've been on Netflix team, even if it's for three years, five years, and you moved on, you can then say, I was on Netflix, I was the best in those few years. So this is, is a, a core uh, idea behind Netflix and behind its remuneration, behind its values, its integrity. So ultimately, in a, in a very disruptive world, it's your employees, the talent you have in your company that's going to help you survive. So you've got to empower your people and be prepared to constantly redeploy. If you're not redeploying, and there's a whole lot of financial measures, they look at capital recycling and capital renewal, and we can look at some of these analytics to get behind that. But that's the idea. We want to see companies re revising themselves. And again, we can look at some case studies. Clearly, Fuji versus Kodak. One company survived the move to digital camera imaging, and the other company did. So adapt or perish. There's a few names of companies that didn't get there. So it's ultimately a mindset. Keep away from groupthink. Companies do get into that. There's a lot of evidence of that. You eliminate these silos and power structures because that, in particularly in big companies, it, it seem, seems to contribute to corporate failure. And always look outside where you traditionally are. Reinvent your company. Reinvent. So the, the surviving companies tend to do that. So here's my little summary of what I think you can learn and how you respond to digital disruption. And it's not that complex, really. Ultimately, you've got to have a vision. If you don't have a vision, well, we can go, have, go to the coffee shop and drink coffee or do something. But if you've got a vision, you're going to go out there and head towards this win-win sort of situation. Build the culture. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of organisations.
organisational culture. A lot of my academic research has been in, in culture, in national cultures, organisational cultures, and how groups respond. And, and we can look at and we can learn lots of lessons. And what, but what, what we get told from the research literature is once you get a court organisation's culture in place, it's extremely hard to ever change it. And particularly in startups, and the first thing the venture capitalists do in Silicon Valley is get the culture in the company before there are 10 employees. Because what they say is once you go beyond 10, your culture is fixed. You've got to get it right at the beginning. You've got to be agile. Once you've got that, you've got to be constantly adapting and be prepared to not stay with the old. Don't stick with these nostalgic strategies. Oh, we've done that for a few years or, you know, whatever. It's not going to keep you in business. And as we learn from Netflix and others, the best companies are going to have the best and brightest people working for them. So getting that talent, making it, making your company the best in the world, your organization the best, is the, is the way to survive in this disruptive environment. It may not guarantee you survival, but it will give you a chance to survive. And if you want to be kept in the old bowl, you don't adapt. If you want to get out here, get into the future, you've got to jump out of the old swimming pool, do something completely new. So that's uh, my lessons on disruption. I find it uh, a fascinating area. I, as I said earlier, I don't have all the answers, but I know it's right in front of me. It's right there, and I'm doing my best to try and adapt as quickly as I can to this new world. It's very exciting. It's a great opportunity for us all. I think Stephen mentioned that earlier. The opportunities are there, but there's also a lot of risk, and we've got to be prepared to take some of those risks. They may not all pay off. But thank you very much for your attention this morning, and I'm happy to take some questions if we've got some, some time. Interests yeah. and I just wonder to what to what extent states and governments and vested interests are going with this, or actually trying to disrupt the disruption. I think your second point is more to the same because I saw an example I just given. It's a very simple one. Just a newspaper column this morning about the Prime Minister of Singapore saying how he's going to protect the taxi industry to protect those who are being disrupted by Uber and some of the other uh, apps. Now, I see a lot of governments around the world being reactive. This is, this is unknown territory because the future is predict uh, uh, predictably scary. What kind of jobs are we going to have if these robotics and interconnectivity occur? It's going to be massive transformation. It's not going to be just in the traditional manufacturing industries, but a lot of the service sector industries we take for granted today are going to change or change rapidly or be re possibly replaced by... Um, by some kind of robot. And we see that whether it's driverless cars. There won't be pilots in aeroplanes in 20 years' time, I guarantee that. The US Air Force has most of its Air Force fleet flown by robots now. It's less than 50% of the total US Air Force fleet of the, 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 the military. It's mostly, we call, you know, drones or, or whatever. But these are getting more powerful all the time. Now, will that, how will that transition now? You know, and how will we as consumers, when we get on a plane, when we know this is just a, a robot or a computer or somebody sitting in an office somewhere that's controlling a computer that flies the airplane when we want to come to Singapore for the next conference. But the day in the future will come very soon when it possibly won't be. And when someone offers you a cup of tea in the aisle or a snack, it'll be a robot. They're already delivering pizzas and things. There are certainly yeah. dangers in that because one of my doctoral students is doing her PhD on, on uh, safety in the, in the airline industry mm. and what she says is most planes are flown by computers. Mm. When yeah. you take off and you land it's computers doing it. Right? The, the crew are just sitting there. Right? Mm. But sometimes the technology goes wrong. Yeah. And she said that what then happens is all their training kicks in and they sort it out, except when they don't. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's, again, that's the, the, certainly the case, and uh, certainly with medical imaging, imaging and, and diagnostics, a lot, of that, a lot of that's all done now. You go to your surgeon or your uh, health professional or whatever to get some advice. It's all the computer works around and tells them this is what's going on. They'll read all your x-rays and do all, and it all comes back to you. And, and, the, and that's all about this connectivity, and, and certainly with the human genome. Everybody's gene around the world can be compared identically now. It's all the technology that bang, they can go, and that's all done in a matter of milliseconds. The billions of people, all, all that database of, of individual. So, you know, there's a huge wealth of information, and that's all available then to either a computer to decide, decide what to do, or a human who can then get all that information and have that presented to them. So, we have much more powerful decision making potential as individuals, but we also could be you know, this is the big fear, replaced. <laughs> and so that, that's the future of work debate that, that Stephen alluded to. And, and it's a big debate everywhere in the world as we envisage the future. Who's going to, and, and the, in the financial services industry, 80 or 90% of the, the funds management now is it's all algorithm. You, you, you think you might be speaking to a, a, it's a, it's a, a voice at the other end that's not human, <laughs> sounds human telling you how to invest your pension fund or whatever. It's, but they worked out your wealth strategy, your position in life, and compared you to the spectrum, and bang, this is the, the financial advice that you get. And only very, very rarely will the humans get involved. All the big trading funds are all digitally programmed. Uh, it's, there's, there's a little bit of human oversight if they think something's going wrong, but the basic programs for all the big hedge funds are all driven by algorithms. The people don't do that much, you know, fine tuning on the on the, on the day by day, or microsecond by microsecond, that these things trade at. I don't know if that answered your question, but it just threw off. I think governments really yeah, haven't got the answers yet. They haven't thought through how significant these changes are. And I don't know groups like Stephen Cedar are asking the question, but I think a lot of groups are reactive, not not wanting to. You know, and, but the, I think Singapore is a good example of a country that's trying, you know, one of the better countries looking forward. Maybe the UK, certainly the US, but, uh, you know, we'll see, not necessarily politically, but there's a very strong private sector that's been reinventing itself there. Um, and we see even in Germany, you know, the so-called reshoring. So a lot of European, particularly German companies, are bringing back to, to Germany because it's all going to be robotic manufacturing, same as the US. They're reshoring at a massive rate. And that's going to be the big thing. And, the, and, and, and Australia, as a country, in my country, we sort of say, we're expecting to benefit from the Asian century. But the Asian century was predicated on this belief that it's going to provide a lot of services to the developed world, particularly the US and Europe. That may not happen because these places will reshore most of their industry that they had exported in the 60s, 70s and 80s, they're all going to come back on board. There's different jobs because the, the, the particularly um, ma the manufacturing sectors are all going to be done by robots. But there's all still a lot of distribution, but maybe that's driverless cars and trucks. And, but there'll be people, there's a whole lot of new jobs that will be supporting this new kind however, of economy. However, okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I, have you got a bed crystal ball? Have you seen No, no, no. It's just that, you know, um, I look at what happened in Australia on the evening of the 9th of, uh, of August. Uh, it was census time in Australia. Mm. And we were all told to go online to fill in the census information. Guess what? The, the computer crashed. Why? Because some boy somewhere was able to infiltrate IBM's computer system, was able to send it into orbit. Yep. So, Look, at the end of the day, all of the disruption, disruption comes in many forms. And so let's not believe that, the, you know, that it's all going to be the be-all and end-all. Around the government support as well, again, you know, picking up a couple of points there, uh, it is true that governments looking at uh, outsourcing and so on, greater use of computer technology and delivery of benefits and whatever it might be, because it takes out something of the human element and that face-to-face -face having to deal with people. But the fastest growing, in my view, the fastest growing industry that's going to come through digital disruption is going to be the legal profession. Because if you're in a driverless car and you happen to run someone over, whose fault is it? 
who can you sue? Can you sue the driverless car? There isn't a driver in it. Do you, do you, can you sue the, the person that's got the, the camera technology that's around? Maybe not. Who's actually programmed where you've got to go? Is it IBM or is it somebody else? So the fastest growing profession in the world is going to be the legal profession. If you're telling your kids what to be, I reckon start to study digital law. There you go. There's a tip. <laughs> okay. I'll go, I'll go and re-educate my children now. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> any, any other questions or comments? Uh, do you know, do you, do you reflect on the stuff you've got to reflect on these kind of issues in your own country, in your own yeah, environment? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think the UK is quite sports of this, we're talking about like certain like uh, cultures being reckoned sports with this sort of disruption like so see we've had a lot of changes with um, support for Amazon recently in the UK so they can now fly drones below yeah, certain yeah. levels. So that's kind of uh, facilitating those uh, under an hour delivery kind of ideas that mm. Bozos has got. Yep. But yeah, that's a, that's a, like, and that's another interesting point is is the need for a lot of legal, whether it's not only the, the, the contestable law, but, yeah, but it's the legal they, frameworks they, in which technology I mean, is made, operating. Uh, they, they, you know, they've uh, said that for this particular time, they're going to actually uh, dispense with some of the uh, formalities of the laws to do with mm -hmm. this sort of thing as well. And there's been. Uh, yeah, no, it's very interesting. Yeah, we've had, I've been involved in a couple of drone companies in Australia, and or drone or UAV companies we call them, unmanned vehicle. But the whole, the, a lot of the issues there, uh, and we've had CASA, which is our Civil Aviation Safety Authority in Australia, uh, review all of all of its regulations in the last couple of years. Again, trying to to free up this space for the possible use in a whole range of different applications, from you know monitoring infrastructure, agriculture. Uh, safety. We've just one of the groups I'm involved with is, is the surfing and surf life saving. And this year we've just uh, we're, we're in the process. And this year we'll have uh, uh, drones that have uh, uh, deployable life saving vests. And so and they'll have GPS trackers. They've got everything. They can find the person who is in, in an ocean or difficult situation. Drop safety gear to them. Have that all monitored before human intervention, so they get this done really quickly. So it's, it's a lot of win-wins possibly out of this. It's not just things like that. In the UK as well, I know there's been big moves. I mean, it's quite a while now ago since, um, I mean, there isn't any driverless cars in the UK, but the legislation's in place yeah, to, to put it in place. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, you know, we're talking about sort of changes in business models as well there, but like, uh, you know, there's like, at the same time we're talking about driverless cars, but we're also talking at the way in which, uh, like, uh, the car industry, is being disrupted as well. This kind of moves mm -hmm. are there away from sort of ownership almost into sort of. Well, that's the other side of that is you know having have like an Airbnb for cars. You yeah, know, cars and car pools. And, I mean, I think that's kind one. of starting to sort of yeah. emerge a bit now, really. Yeah. yeah so yeah, the, the whole and, and then you've got like Tesla coming in, replacing with electronic and sustainable vehicles, uh, to the traditional petrol, um, you know. Car, you know, carbon-based sort of fuel system. So a lot of change going on in the auto. In the auto industry, is going to be a big one. But the other side of that is is the, the capacity of drones and the connectivity there. And where I see those things, the drones are getting stronger and better, and and it won't. You know, they'll be emerging because everyone's envisaged since I was a boy of you, you sort of being able to jump in a, and fly, not having to sit in the car and drive on the ground. Now that drone and the auto vehicle industry is probably not too far away. You know, probably in the next decade. We're going to see drone, the drones, well certainly they can lift big payloads now, but that the capacity of DJI Industries, the big Chinese drone manufacturer, probably the leader, are, are going to lift you know, 30, 50, 100 kilo packages. That's a human being. You can just sit in your drone, bang, off to work. You don't even need a vehicle. Now that's going to happen probably within this next 20, uh, 10 years, I mean, 2025, something like that, 26. That will be... It will be will be in the, in those in those drones with that kind of pack, and they'll be solar powered. We've already flown around the world indefinitely in solar flight, so solar flat, powered flight is, is not far away. Anyway, I, I, I read a lot about the future. I've been told my future's just ended, <laughs> but it's been a pleasure talking with you uh, today, and I'll be here all day, um, obviously to to talk with you more uh, over coffee. And thank you very much. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Associate Professor Michael Chow. He's from School of Business, Faculty of Business and Economics from the University of Hong Kong. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about um, one area that we think is also kind of like doing disruption. It's also something that Professor Ian and he has mentioned. It's all um, big data and also business analytics. So I'm going to talk about um, some of my research on social and media analytics that I've been working on for the past um, several years. So I'm um, from the School of Business at the University of Hong Kong. So my training is mostly in um, kind of the technical side of information system. So I'm not a very mainstream business person. Actually, I'm doing more research in um, kind of technical analysis. So uh, as I said, uh, I got my bachelor in computer science. So I do research in big data, data mining, text mining, social media analytics, and so on. Oh, so I'm going to give a brief introduction of big data. I think most of you are familiar with big data, so I'll do that part relatively quickly. And then I'll talk about one specific part of big data that we think is quite important is on the analytics on social media. Then I'll talk about some of the research projects that I've done on social media. Oh, so we know um, we have got a lot of data from various sources, like online transactions, mobile applications, Sensors, like in supply chain everywhere, we know everything is connected to everything else, as we have heard in the in the two speeches earlier this morning. We also have like images, audio, video that are being uploaded to the web, to everywhere, uh, or can share with everyone. Um, and then another important one is social media, including blogs or Weibo, there's kind of the micro blogs in China. Uh, so Facebook and forums. So these are what we call user-generated contents, UGC. And that's a very really large part of what we are actually looking at uh, on the internet right nowadays. When you go goes on, when when you go on your know, like Facebook again, they will be checking your fan status. You'll be uploading videos, uploading images, and your status and so on. So again, like we are thinking, like all these, actually a lot of business organizations and also universities, researchers have find that all these actually have a lot of values inside. So a lot of opportunities for mining these data to come up with business value. But um, of course, I, um, it's not an easy task because the amount of data is large. So we need to find a good way to download or to collect the data we need to cleanse the data and also to analyze that. So the four V's of big data, how many of you have heard about the four V's of big data? Okay, so all, almost all of you, but uh, so I'm just doing a quick one. So some people say big data is just about big, it's just volume. But actually like we are, some people say three V's, some people say five, but uh, this one definition from IBM is four V's. So it's not just talking about big, um, although like sometimes people are saying the name is a little bit misleading, you know, we got big data. So volume, like being big, is one of them. But a lot of times when we talk about big data, it also has other um, characteristics, like the velocity, that means the data will be coming in very quickly. It's not like you have a set of big static data that you are working on. It's kind of, again, like social media data are coming in every second. Like um, online business transactions, you have a website, you have a point of sale system, all those data are coming in like every second. So you have the velocity of data and also sensor data. Variety of data, so again, it's not just one single source of data. Traditionally, people are analyzing sales data or some other kind of traditional accounting data in their databases. But when we talk about big data, we don't have a variety. Again, like sensors data, image data, um, video data, audio data, social media, text data, that means people have written something, it's not in structured format. And the last one is veracity. Again, it's not a very common word that people use, but um, because it starts with V, so they pick it. So it's uh, actually saying a lot of data are actually not very accurate. Again, it's not like the transaction data that you get in your database, they are called relatively more accurate, but then when you talk about online social media data, you may have something that are not accurate. Some people may be kind of making jokes uh, or intentionally saying something that is not correct, and, but still you try to infer something from those, like from your Facebook status, from everything that you have posted on Facebook or, or on Twitter, 
that is this person a trustworthy person? Then you may try to find a way to um, analyze that. So you look at some of the data, and then you need to find a way to tell whether the data is accurate or not. So these are some of the um, figures provided actually I got it from IBM. So, uh, so I'm going to go through it quickly. Basically, I think we are generating like terabytes of data every day. So uh, in the past, it was kind of like not possible. But now, it is actually um, technologically possible and also not expensive because we have our cell phones to generate data and also all those memory casted based hard drives are becoming cheaper and cheaper and we also have platform to support that. Uh, velocity of data, we know like um, financial data or like sensor data in cars, like in a Tesla car or in an aeroplane, you have a lot of sensor data that are collecting all this, a lot of sensors that are collecting all these data. Again, they can be very useful like for um, doing analysis. For example, Tesla or some other cars, they actually can send back all, the, all those um, kind of sensor data, like the status of your machines, the engines, the cars, to Tesla, and then they can do analysis to, to, to know whether your car needs maintenance and so on, and also for their future design of their car. Also trading data, we are talking about high frequency trading, social network data, okay? The variety, as we talk about, like people are uploading everything online. Um, so you have a lot of social, uh, socially generated data, social connections also. So we know the relationship between people. Who are the people you talk to most frequently? Also, you have um, the other one is actually about health data or like wearable devices. So how many of you are using like a Fitbit or <laughs> kind of like a step counter that you use on your cell phone? And many of and many of us may be using that. So, um, yeah. And so some of you are actually also using some devices to measure your like um your your pulse um or some of your other um status health statuses. So all these actually can be again important can be can be sent to databases to um for analysis. And again, like as mentioned in earlier talks, like kind of your human genome data. Probably in 10 to 20 years, it will become even even cheaper to analyze one person's genome. It will be probably maybe a few US dollars you can do that. Then you can everyone can store that data somewhere, and then when they go to the hospital, then they can do they can again do comparison with many many come with, with all the genomes in in the in the whole world's genome database, and then you may find whether you have some hidden issues or some special health conditions because of your genes. And then you you can treat that um like correspondingly. So and now we are doing that. We know we have a electronic health um kind of records in the U.S. and a lot of countries are going through similar reforms. That means you have better organizations of all those information. And some of you might have heard the IBM Watson. So they have the system that that will do that kind of comparison of your health records with millions of health records of other people and also medical literature. Oh, so veracity um, about actually many of the data we collect are not accurate. So we actually need to find a good way to um, to see how to make them accurate. So interestingly, one in three business leaders don't trust the information they use to make decisions. So a lot of times, yeah, you have a lot of complicated forms or POS systems like um, that. People are actually asked to spend a lot of time enter those those um card to fill in those forms to enter all the information. Even in the electronic health record that I just mentioned, a lot of medical doctors in the US are already very really frustrated because like every time after they have seen the patient, they need to five, spend five to ten minutes to just fill in the the tedious form. So sometimes they may skip some fields, maybe they will just enter like um Kind of, um, casually. I think many of us have that experience, right? When you have a very long form or a very long survey, and towards the end, you just press enter and you just click, click, click without looking at all the details, right? I, I think that's, that's kind of human nature. So that will introduce errors in a lot of data that you, we have. Oh, so we know a lot of big data investment by different industries, as we mentioned healthcare and then. Um, also, like insurance, transportation, we are, 
actually every field are doing a lot of uh, investment and of course I mean, see government is probably not spending as much and by region so led by the US and then Euro, uh, North America and then Euro and then Asia Pacific is a little bit lagging behind but it's catching up so we, we are looking at like if you look at um, mainland China they have been doing a lot of big data initiatives in the, in the past few years Okay, so we have talked about the fundamental of big data analytics. Um, is like we are talking about the four V's, but um, with the four V's, then we need to have some way to analyze the data, right? We we know the data are out there; they have a lot of values. But then we need to have ways. We need to have computer programs and algorithms to analyze all these data in order to make them useful. So some people say there is a fifth V. That's the value. How you find the value from the data? So um, it's actually um, not an easy task. So aside from like six or seven years ago, people have started to look at this problem um, with a lot of um, again, research ethos from universities and also uh, industry. So if you are from a computer science department, you know probably you have some colleagues or yourself maybe working on big data. Uh, so we need to find some new platforms to capture, to store, to analyze this big data. So you may have heard about terms like Hadoop or like MapReduce or some other similar technologies that can handle big data. So the, the idea is you don't need a very expensive supercomputer anymore to handle all the big data. That, that was what, what people did in the past. Like 20 years ago, if you want to store very big data, you need to have a supercomputer, super infrastructure for your databases. But now um, what you need is you um, with kind of Hadoop or similar technology, what you, we do is distributed computing. So, and also distributed storage and analysis. So what you need is, you need um, probably 20, 30, or, or the, depending on the size. But what you need is a large number of inexpensive computers. So you can take some like computers that are like, um, say, 3,000 US dollars each. So a little bit more expensive than personal computer, but kind of a relatively cheap server computer. You take 20 or 30 of them, then it will work much better than a supercomputer because like, it's more fault tolerant. If one of the computer is not working, you can simply just, just pull it out and then replace it with a new one. So that's some technology that was originally used by Google and kind of they, they disclose some of their details and other companies other organizations or, or developers have made open source. So that's a Hadoop architecture. So um, that's one example. So we need a lot of different new technologies to handle these big data. Okay. So um, some of the things that people have been doing in big data, um, we know like some of the challenges, we need to have unstructured data, we need real-time analytics, and then we need to have social media analytics as we said, social media is one important part of big data. So people have been looking at tax and sentiment analysis and also some social network analysis. And then we need to uh, do some predictive modeling. So a lot of times we want to do prediction based on customers' pre behavior. I want to predict the customers' kind of future behavior. Right? So um, also I want to predict um, the demand of something, uh, of a product and so on. So um, usually that will involve statistical method or some new AI and data mining method. So and that's why uh, a lot of people now are talking about deep learning in the past two or three years. It's time to use deep learning in this area. Also at the end, we need to visualize the data. So when we have um, very large data, what is the best way to visualize them? So of course when we have simple data, we know we use chart. We use 2D chart or bar chart, pie chart, and so on. But then when we have like millions or tens of millions of records, people find there are better way to visualize them. Or some unstructured data, like text data, network data, and there may be better way to visualize them. Oh, so as we said, so today we will focus a little bit more on social media. So social media, we may have like what we call collaborative projects, Wikipedia, Visionary. So some people actually when you talk about social media, you first think about Twitter, Facebook and so on. But actually these are also some other type of social media. That because it's like um, again contributed by many different people. 
and then they work collaboratively, and then they they have it on the social platform. They also interact with each other. So another type is like blogs and writer blogs, like Twitter, Weibo. I think nowadays there are fewer and fewer people writing blogs somehow because um, people tend to write shorter and shorter, so it becomes micro blogs. But there are also blogs that people are writing. Content communities like uh, uh, actually, actually uh, I want to include like forums. So that's another one that that uh, people have been doing. Content communities where people share their content like YouTube sharing videos or like Instagram sharing their photos. And social networking sites like Facebook um, or like kind of MySpace in the past, not, not very popular anymore, like Facebook, Google Plus, virtual game worlds. So these are relatively more um, more niche type of social media like virtual game worlds or virtual social worlds like World of Warcraft where, where people are playing games but they actually talk to each other when they are playing when they, they type to each other or they, they talk to each other using the microphone when they are playing those games or like social worlds so Second Life was very popular a few years back so now I think it become less popular but we may have some newer um, uh, virtual social world like emerging in the future. So that's kind of like a virtual environment where people again interact with each other with their avatars. So again they, they talk to each other in the game. They they can also like give some um, presence to, to others in, um, in the game. Um, in so the next one like as I start with story of data sets, yes. So I have shown the two types of data sets, one is NoSQL and SQL database. So now the third challenge is analyzing. So analyzing is the ch third challenging one. So we have many tools. So we have many tools for that. So HSEP. So there are many tools which are available for platform analytics. So here are all real-time analytical platforms. So here are real-time analytical tools. So it is an open source. Apache Spark is also open source. So we have two open source here. So rest of them are enterprise. So, analytical tool, yeah. Stream analytical tools. No difference. It's just an different providers. Yeah. So it is under Apache. They are different. Enterprise. Oh, okay, here it is micro batch processing, here it is real time. So here we can process micro batch. Maybe I have one second information. So I can specify milliseconds. So that is Apache Spark. The storm is more of real time. Real time, more of real time. Okay, so storm is basically your uh, real time. Yes. Apache Spark is your uh, micro batch. Micro batch processing. Then you have a loop which is like batch processing. Batch processing. So these three are the, the main challenges always in the business analytics. So now how do we perform analysis using these tools and how do we get the better results to make better decisions. So that is the another challenge. So normally in the business analytics we will be extracting the meaningful information, we call it as better insights and from the insights we need to make the better decisions. So example, I can give you a simple example to understand. So a credit card companies. Example, we have a list of customers. So we want to find out who are the potential customers. Yes. So that if, if I can find out the potential customers, I can give some combo offers. So that is my intention. So how can I find out the potential customers? Yes. So here, basically, so there will be a customers who will be using the cards and making a transactions, but they will pay the bills at due time, yes? So there will be a customer who pay the bills at due times, 
So these particular customers are not profitable customers for the credit card companies. Yes. So there will be a customers who wish to pay the dues. So they are charged. So these customers are the profitable customers for the credit card companies. So the analytical that is the credit card company must target the profitable customers. So for the profitable customers, I can give some combo offers. Okay. I can give some combo offers. So that, that is the insight is nothing but the potential customers, the decisions are like I can give the annual fee renewable. So annual fee, no annual fee, no renewable fee, package elements. So I can give some of the offers. So that we call it as decisions. So from the insights, I, will, I have to make some better decisions in order to satisfy the customers. So that is the challenging, another challenge. So making a better decision is the challenging one in the analytics. So next one, here they are saying that the business analytics is to understand the data. So any idea about this? Understanding the data and remain competitive and it can be used for generating the reports. It's all general advantages. So for example, in any businesses, so the first step is understanding the domain. Understanding the domain is the first stage in any business. So remember, business analytics, so they follow some of the standards. If we are performing some analytics, I can follow some standards. So have you heard about KDD? So these are all the standards which we follow in the analytics. So CRISP DM is one of the standards. So actually we have used CRISP DM for the business analytical projects. So what is the advantage of CRISP DM or any other standards? Okay. So for example in the CRISP DM like out of 100 percentage of the company, around 40 percentage of the company are using CRISP DM standards. So it's like a software models. So maybe if I'm doing some software projects, I might be using waterfall model or agile model. Yes. So similarly, for business analytics, I might be using any one of these standards, either CRISP or KDD or some. So I just described you about the CRISP DM standards. So normally here, the first step in any business is the understanding, that is business understanding. So here I can give you the example, I can say the trading system. So normally we have used 64 rules for performing the operations. So the 64 rules have been taught by the domain expertise. So from the National Stock Exchange, so they come to us and they thought about their business rules. So maybe for example, one of the rule, like if I am making some transactions, the particular transaction should not cross the threshold limit like 20% or 15%. So there is a threshold limit for every transaction. So consider yesterday, yesterday I bought a units for $1000. But if I am selling it by today, I should not cross 15 percentage of the threshold limit, which means maximum I can sell it for 1150. So that is a rule. So if this particular threshold limit is crossed, then I should identify that particular transactions and I should stop that. Yes. So that is my intention. So if that particular threshold limit is crossing, then I should stop the process or transactions. So it's all happening in the real time, okay, generally. So that is one of the rules. So similarly, for my business, I might be having many rules. So I need to understand the rules. That is business domain. So that we call it as business understanding, the first stage in any of the projects. So the second stage is data understanding. second stage is the data understanding. So remember, in the trading systems or any systems, I might be having the data attributes. I may be having, uh, for, for particular transaction, I might be having 10 attributes. 
maybe the price, stock ID, stock name, so at the timestamp. So all these attributes I might be adding. So I need to define timestamp. So it is timestamp, the value, the data type. So similarly for stock price, it is integer. So I should define all the attributes. So that is data understanding. In the data understanding, I must understand what is the data type and what is the given information. I need to understand. So once if I understand the data, then I can prepare. So normally the trading information is so sensitive, they will not give you the original data sets. Yes? So that's why we need to understand the business, understand the data, and then how we can prepare data. So now based on the understanding of the data formats and rules, now we can prepare the information, that is data. So data preparation, the third stage. So normally we follow these steps. But consider many of the businesses, they do not view the analytics to outside. So they are their own data sets. So they do not follow this. Directly they can go to the analytical platform to perform the analysis. So we call it as modeling. The stage four, we call it as modeling. So have you heard about modeling? So modeling is nothing but just applying and techniques just applying and techniques, any data mining techniques, algorithms. So now consider I may be having many data sets, I need to apply some algorithm. So that we call it as modeling. So the stage four. So once this particular stage is done, the sixth stage is to evaluate. So maybe like I might have used some data sets, I might have prepared some data sets. I need to compare the results with the business understanding, the rules, whether it is satisfied the particular rule or not. So I need to understand. So evaluation. So once the evaluation is done properly, like all of the business rules are satisfied, then I can deploy. Then I can deploy in the end round. So the sixth one is deploy. So remember, this six stages always been followed in the any business analytical process. So what is the third step? The so data is already existing, right? Yeah. For example, uh, the trading system, as I said, so the trading system it is in sensitive information. They will not reveal to us. So normally they just give us the data, sample data sets, and so as well as sample data sets or dummy data sets or any rules. So they would be giving the rules and the data types. So we must understand the given rules and data type and we need to prepare. We need to prepare our on our own. So that is the data preparation. So normally they do these steps. So the tree actually the transform. The transform here we do here. Data preparation. Everything will be done here. Yes. They can't understand just understanding the data types. Yeah. Yeah. Just the types. Modeling, yes, correct. So finally, once if the model is verified, then you can deploy it in the industry. In the real time. Evaluation of the results to see whether it makes sense. Yes, correct. It deploy, correct. Crisp, crisp. So, how will it be different from KDD? So, for example, you have the KDD. So, in the KDD, you don't have business understanding. So, directly you go with the data sets. So, that's why many of the projects are getting failure. So, 